Hey, can we just uh, give it up for the worship band this morning? Man, so cool. And you know what? Um, it's really cool to see some new faces up there, uh, just jumping right in with what we're doing. So thank you to you all, and uh, good to be with you this morning. My name is Ryan. I'm the lead pastor here at Genesis, and as Joe said, if you're new with us, would you just let us know you were here? Like, we, we want to be able to connect with you, not in a weird way. We're not going to come to your house and, you know, bring you a baked bread or something like that. We just want to hear from you. Let us know how we can best serve you and your family. And as he mentioned, we're in this series in the book of Acts. And uh, as I was studying for this message today, I got to thinking about this phrase that we use a lot in the church, and sometimes we'll see a lot even outside the church. And the phrase is, Jesus saves. Y'all know that, that, right? Like you'll see that like on someone's t-shirt or maybe on a sign, you'll see Jesus saves. And it's a good phrase. It's, it's a biblical phrase. We, we see it throughout the scriptures, this idea of Jesus being a savior, that he is creating and inviting people into this saving relationship with him. The apostle Paul writes about the idea of Jesus saving extensively throughout his letters in the New Testament in places like Romans 10, verse 10, where, where he writes, for it's by believing in your heart that you're made right with God, and it's by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. Even Jesus himself makes mention of this idea of him being the Savior and being a saving entity in the world where he says in Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and, what's the word? Save those who are lost. Now, maybe you've heard someone say things like, well, you know, I was saved as a teenager, or I was saved as a young, uh, you know, a young child, or I was saved later in life, or Jesus saved me from when I was caught in addiction at some point in my life, right? But, but it makes me ask the question, what do we really mean when we use that phrase? Like, what do we really mean when we see, say, Jesus saves, or, or that Jesus saved me, or, or better yet, what does it really mean that Jesus is the Savior? So with that in mind, I want you to grab your phone if you haven't done so yet, open up the YouVersion app, the Bible app. You can follow along with everything I'm going to read here. We're going to cover a lot of scripture today, so it might be a useful tool if you want to take some notes or refer back to it. If you have your Bible with you, we're going to be in Acts chapter 13, and we're going to be starting it in verse 13 this morning. Now, last week, we looked at the first 12 verses of uh, Acts chapter 13, and in it, we were introduced to Paul and some of his companions, Barnabas and John Mark. Now, through the prayers of the church and the leading of the Holy Spirit, they set out toward the island of Cyprus, and eventually, they end up in the city of Paphos, where they, conf they confront this false teacher that we talked about last night last week, named Bar-Jesus. And, and they helped this governor of that area to take a step of faith in believing in Jesus. But they're only in Paphos temporarily. This is, they're passing through to get to somewhere else, which is where we're going to pick it up in Acts chapter 13. They're done at Paphos, and now they're going to be moving on. Acts chapter 13, verse 13. Y'all ready? Let's do it. Paul and his companions then left Paphos by ship for Pamphylia landing at the port town of Perga. There, John Mark left them, which we'll come back to that later, and returned to Jerusalem. But Paul and Barnabas traveled inland to Antioch of Pisidia. Okay, so I just want to give you an idea of where Paul and his guys are heading, all right? Because these are a lot of P names just coming out of nowhere, and you probably don't know any of them or very few uh, no, numbers of them. So I just want to give you uh, an idea of like, where are they right now? Because they're traveling a lot. So let me just show you a little map, a little geography lesson here. Why don't you bring up the map there? All right. So here we are. On the right-hand side, you can see they started in the area of Syria and Antioch. They take off from Seleucia to Salamis to Paphos, which is where they were last week on the island of Cyprus. Now they've headed up north to Perga in Pamphylia, and then all the way up north to Antioch in Pisidia. Got it? Yeah. Great. Just so you know, this area, it would be modern-day Turkey, okay? So you have Syria, you have Israel just south of that. They're now in modern-day Turkey. Okay, so you can see 
they leave this area and they head to this area in Antioch in uh, Pisidia in modern day Turkey. And they're doing it for a particular reason. They are moving through this area to establish some groundwork that God wants to do because eventually they're going to make their way back and they're going to establish the foundation of the church in the Roman Empire. They're just making some soft introductions as they make their way up into northern Turkey. So back to verse 14. We know where they are now. Here's what happens when they get to Pisidia in, uh, Antioch in Pisidia. Verse 14, it says, But Paul and Barnabas traveled inland to Antioch of, Antioch of Pisidia. On the Sabbath, they went to the synagogue for the services, much like we would do on the Sabbath, right? And after the usual readings from the books of Moses and the prophets, those in charge of the service sent them this message. Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, come and give it. So it's likely that Paul and Barnabas were easily recognized as leaders within the Jewish religion of the first century. And there are some demarcations that someone like a, a teacher of religious law or a Pharisee or a rabbi would have physical items like a prayer shawl or uh, the way they cut their hair or the way that they dress that would signify this is a leader in Judaism in the first century. And so it was commonplace if you were to visit a synagogue or another temple of some sort and you were traveling through, if you were in the services, uh, the leaders would say, hey, another brother of ours, a teacher, a, a rabbi, a religious leader, why don't you share with us some of what's been going on in your life? Tell us a little bit about what you've been learning uh, from Jesus, or, or not Jesus, from God, right? And so they, 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 this would be a commonplace thing within these synagogues. And so Paul and Barnabas are, are seen as those sorts of people, and so they're invited. Hey, why don't you come and share a little bit about what's going on in your life? And so Paul, you know, he's real shy, Paul. Just kidding, he's not. He, he takes this as a great opportunity. Verse 16. So Paul stood, <laughs> lifted his hand to quiet them, which I think is very bold, but whatever, and he started speaking. Men of Israel, he said, and you God-fearing Gentiles, listen to me. The God of this nation of Israel chose our ancestors and made them multiply and grow strong during their stay in Egypt. Then with a powerful arm, he led them out of their slavery. He put up with them through 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. He put up with them, Paul says. Isn't it true that God just kind of puts up with us a lot, right? Does God put up with you? He puts up with me a lot, and thank God for his loving kindness towards me. He's just putting up with them. Verse 19, then he destroyed seven nations in Canaan and gave their land to Israel as an inheritance. All of this took about 450 years. After that, God gave them judges to rule until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people begged for a king, and God gave them Saul, son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, who reigned for 40 years. But God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He'll do everything I want him to do. Let's stop there for a second. You know, let's consider where Paul is right now. He is in a synagogue filled with people who have grown up and live within the Jewish religion. Why in the world is Paul just regurgitating some story that they have all heard a million times prior. Now, I will say that you have to keep in mind that this is a very illiterate society. Not everybody can read and write. And so in oral traditions, it's very common for you to repeat things over and over and over again so that people have reference for what you're talking about. You know, if you read a book, sometimes you don't retain everything you read the first time you read it. Sometimes you have to go back and read it again, and the same is true, especially in oral traditions. But Paul is doing something even greater than just regurgitating the story so that they remember it. Paul is doing something so that he can set these people up to hear the story of Jesus for the first time, right? So Paul then turns the page on what he's about to say in verse 23. After he's explained this whole story, he then says this, and it is one of King David's descendants, Jesus, who is God's promised savior of Israel. 
Before he came, John the Baptist preached that all the people of Israel needed to repent of their sins and turn to God and be baptized. As John was finishing his ministry, he asked, do you think I'm the Messiah? No, I'm not. But he's coming soon, and I'm not even worthy to be a slave and untie the sandals on his feet. Paul is a genius in his ability to be able to tell the story of Jesus in a way that connects the dots for those who are listening. He's telling the story of the Israelites in Egypt and their eventual leaving Egypt and being you know, freed from slavery. He's telling him the story of the placement of King David as their earthly king in order for him to connect the dots with those listening to Jesus. Now, just a side note on this. If you read the story of Acts and you read Paul's letters, you will find that Paul is brilliant at being able to tell the story of Jesus in context, which means that he doesn't tell it the same way no matter where he goes. He understands that everybody in the room might be hearing that story in a very different manner. And so when he's with Jewish compatriots and friends and listeners, he tells it from a Jewish perspective. And when he's with his Gentile friends, like in places in Athens, he looks around and he says, man, there's a lot of dots I can connect for them between what they know and believe and the person of Jesus. That should be informative for us as we think about how do we share the story of Jesus in our 21st century? Because people are in very different places with that. And depending on where you are, even in our own country, we tell the story maybe just a little bit differently because we want to connect the dots with people. Okay, enough of that. Back to our regular scheduled programming. Here we go. So, smack dab in the middle of this monologue, Paul says these words. He says, Jesus is God's promised Savior of Israel. And when he says those words, I can only believe the chatter that must be going on in the synagogue. He has overstepped his welcome, which I think is also one reason why they quickly exit city to city (laughs) because they say some things and a lot of people are like, you got to get out of here, man. (laughs) We're not ready for this. And so in doing so, he is telling those who are listening, he's saying that every moment in Israel's history has been pointing and leading to Jesus. Every story, including the exodus from Egypt, has been a story that is foreshadowing and it is an example of what is going to happen in and through Jesus. This is why Jesus can say things like, I have fulfilled the law and the prophets. Everything that God said to the Israelites in the Old Testament has now been fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And in many cases, a lot of what happened in the Old Testament was simply telling the story of who Jesus would be when he finally arrived on earth, like the Israelites being freed from Egypt. But Paul touches on this story of what happens in Acts 13. But here's what we know. By the end of the book of Genesis, the Israelites have moved into the land of Egypt. There was a famine, and if you remember, Joseph, uh, one of the, the 12 brothers of Jacob, was, you know, he was of prominence in Egypt, and he invites them to come live there, and so they move there, and they're able to take care of their families, and all is well and good. But as generations die off and new generations come to be, and a new pharaoh takes over, There is a threat to the Egyptians, and that is the growth and the power of the Israelites as they multiply in the Egyptian land. And so in order to protect his interests, he decides to enslave all of them. Like, you can live here, but you're going to work for me. And so by the time Exodus 12 is written, the Israelites have been slaves in Egypt for more than 400 years. That's a long time. That's a really long time. And so troubled by the situation, God turns to a guy named Moses, a very unlikely leader, 
And he says, listen, Moses, I need you to go to Pharaoh and tell him, let these people go. I want them free from slavery and I want to lead them to the promised land. And Moses is like, I'm not going to do that. That's crazy, right? And then God convinces them. And so Moses goes. And there's a series of crazy events where there's plagues and there's flies and there's locusts. And then eventually Pharaoh's like, get out of here. And the, you, know, you know the rest of the story? The, the Israelites leave and he parts the Red Sea and they head into the promised land. And it takes them 40 years to get there. But eventually they get to the promised land. And so God saves them from slavery and he leads them into a new life with him. Does that sound familiar? God saves them from captivity and he leads them to a new promise. Do you see what Paul's doing here? This is what Paul is getting at in order to introduce Jesus to those listening. They all know this story. It's a great story. It's their story. And he wants the story of the Israelites being saved from slavery in Egypt to be fresh on the minds of those in the synagogue that day because Jesus, he will claim, has fulfilled all that that story entails. Which is why Paul can say in verse 23, Jesus is God's promised Savior. In short, Paul is answering the question that I asked earlier. He's answering the question, what do we really mean by Jesus saves? Like the Israelites, Jesus saves people from the slavery of sin and he leads them into a new life. Paul talks about this extensively in the New Testament in places like Romans chapter 6. And this is what he writes. He says, when you were slaves to sin... You were free from the obligation to do right. And what was the result? He doesn't even have to write that part. We all know the result, right? But he says, you're now ashamed of the things you used to do, things that end in eternal doom. But now you're free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, the Bible makes it very clear that we, like the Israelites in Egypt, have become slaves to sin. Paul says elsewhere that we were just born into it. Like sin took over in this world when Adam and Eve disobeyed and rebelled against God. And because of that, it is holding us hostage, unwilling to let us go. And it doesn't matter how much, you know, we look at our past and deep inside us and we see the misgivings in our lives. We, we, we all have sinned and we know that there is really no escaping it in and of ourselves. And we know that because we've tried. We tried. We tried to stop doing that thing and then we just keep getting sucked right back in. We've tried to let go of our past. We tried to let go of our shame, but it just keeps digging deeper into our souls and into our hearts. We've tried. And, and maybe we've, we've seen some just like changes a little bit here and there, but eventually we end up back into a sinful pattern of some kind, even if it just looks a little different. And so there is no freeing us like there was no freeing the Israelites from Egypt from our sin. We will be caught in slavery to sin Paul is saying you will be caught enslaved to this sin unless someone or something frees you from it. You need a savior. And so like God freed the Israelites from slavery in the Old Testament, now Jesus frees us from slavery to sin and he leads us into new life now and forever. Jesus is God's promised savior because he frees us from the power of sin in our lives through his death. And he gives us, he gives us the hope and the new life and eternal life through his resurrection. Ephesians 2, Paul writes, but God's so rich in mercy, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, slaves in our sin, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Now listen to this part. It is only by God's grace that you've been saved. 
Right? I think of that story of the Israelites in Egypt. They were hopeless. There was no way out for them. And it was only because of God's grace and desire for them to be reconnected with him that he would send Moses and free them from slavery and lead them to the promised land. And the same is true of Jesus. That in and of ourselves, we cannot escape free of this. We need a savior. But in his grace, even though we've rebelled and sinned against God, in his grace, he comes to us in Jesus and he says, I will set you free. You don't have to be a slave to sin any longer. There is freedom and there is new life to be held. And it is for you. Jesus, the promised Savior, looks at our situation, enslaved and dead in our sins, and he chooses to leave heaven and enter our world. And through his life, death, and resurrection, he has saved us from the consequences of our sin, which is eternal separation from God and hell. I'm not even going to try and sugarcoat that. He's, a, he's allowed us to experience new life that exists now on this earth and all the way into the future beyond this life. You know, later in the book of Romans, Paul would say these words in Romans 10, 13. He says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, which is really important because it means that Jesus isn't just the savior for some. He is the savior for all. He came so that no one would remain slaves to their sin. No matter who you are, what you've done, or where you've been, he is a savior for all, for all who call on his name, who all who recognize I am enslaved, I am held hostage by my sin, and I need a savior. And the only one that I know who has died for my sin and rose from the dead is Jesus. He's the only hope that I have for this life and the life beyond this one. And anyone, it doesn't matter who you are, what you've done or where you've been, anyone who calls on his name and believes that he is the savior of the world will be saved, it says. Oh, thank you for that applause. It gives me a time to drink water. So one more thing about this. Because while this understanding of what it means to be, what it means that Jesus saves is beautiful and it is good and it is great. But I actually think that if that is all we understand of what Jesus saves means, we actually fall a little short. Because it's true that Jesus is our personal savior. He has freed us from sin and he leads to new life. But when we say Jesus saves, if you look at the scriptures, there's way more going on in those words than just that he saved me from my sin. Because listen to this. Listen to this. This, is so, this blew my mind this week as I was writing it. I was like, oh man. Here's the deal. Jesus didn't just save us from something, but he actually saved us for something. Let me say that again. Put that up on the screen, Tyler. Oh, it stopped. Okay, that's all right. Jesus didn't just save us from something. He saved us for something. Now, just hang in with it, there with me, okay? When God frees the Israelites from Egypt and he leads them to the promised land, he didn't just save them from their situation, he also saved them for something greater. Okay, are we preaching now? Are we hearing this? Because you see, God made a promise regarding his people long before he ever rescued them from Egypt. In Genesis chapter 12, God calls the first leader of the Israelites, Abraham, to leave his home and go to a place he will show him. He doesn't even tell him where. Imagine if God came to you today and said, I want you to leave your house and just go. Like, where? I'll tell you when you get there, right? This is Abraham. And so God, this is what God says to him. And as he does, God gives him this promise. Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. 
All the families on earth will be blessed through you. In other words, when God saves the Israelites from Egypt, he saves them, yes, from slavery, but he saves them for the world. He saves them because it's his desire for them to live out that promise he gave to them in Genesis chapter 12 to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. And the same is true of Jesus. Through his life, death, and resurrection, yes, he saves us from sin, but he saves us for the world. It's not just for you. It never was. He saves us from our enslavement to sin and leads us to new life, and he saves us for the renewal and redemption of the world around us. This should fire you up. This should fire you up because here, listen to what, what Paul says. All right. 2 Corinthians 5.20, he says this. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through who? Us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. John 20, 21, Jesus says, the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. you. Okay, not just you, Jane. Thank you. I am sending <laughs> you, right? I am going to, I'm going to bust out of this t-shirt here soon. <laughs> Mark 16, 15. And then he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone, look, you were not just saved from something. You were saved for something. Amen. We are not just bumps on a log. We're like, yay, we get to go to heaven. We have been called to bring redemption to the world, to be a blessing to the nations, to be a blessing to the families in your neighborhood. You were called out of sin and the enslavement of sin so that you could bring redemption to the world. And I got to tell you, I'm going to go off script here a little bit, Tyler. I got to tell you, when we lose sight of that and the church starts to turn inward and it becomes about my salvation, things get really ugly. And you know, you know who's hurt the most? Everybody else. Jesus, I think Jesus is going, children, I didn't just save you from your sin. I saved you for something greater. I saved you for the kingdom. You know, we the church are a collection of saved people. And we are free from sin and shame in our lives. And hallelujah, that is amazing. God's grace is abundant. And at some point, we decided, I need Jesus to save me from my sin, to save me from myself. But for Jesus, that saving you from sin was a means to a greater end. He didn't just save you from sin. He saved you for redemption. He is calling you out into the world to bring hope in the same way he's brought it to you. He has given you a purpose greater than you have ever imagined. Your workplace is no longer just a place of work. Your workplace is a place of redemption. When you go to your neighborhoods this afternoon, this afternoon that's not just where people live. And you happen to live too. If you believe that when you say Jesus saved me, he didn't just save me from something, he saved me for something, then your neighborhoods is a place of redemption. A place where you can bring the good news of Jesus in practical ways and in words and in deeds. That you were called out for a greater purpose. We now, the beneficiaries of salvation in Jesus, have been commissioned for the redemption of the world. This is exactly what Jesus is talking about when he says these words. When he says, Matthew 28, 19, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In other words, I have saved you from sin. You are no longer hostage to the sin of your life. Sin and shame and Satan, they have no hold on you any longer. And now I want you to go. <laughs> I want you to go and tell the world about this. Because there is no greater message. I am putting a new purpose on your life. 
You are not just an accountant anymore. You are not just a teacher anymore. You are no longer just a waitress or, you know, in finance or a wealth management advisor. You are no longer, that is not the highest calling on your life. You have been saved for something. And you will work and operate in those environments. But you've been saved for the redemption of this world. Now go. It's your turn. Go and make disciples. Tell people about me. So here's what Jesus, not, not me, I believe Jesus is asking of all of us in this room. And I want to first start by talking to those of you who have yet to take that step of faith and to declare Jesus as your Savior. Because this morning, by his Spirit's movement, he recognizes sin has a hold on you. It has enslaved you. And as Paul says, the wages of sin is death. And unfortunately, there is nothing that you can do in and of it yourself to try and become free of it, and you know that already. Like the Israelites, without a Savior, you'll just remain in Egypt. But here's the good news for you. Jesus came for you. He died for you. He rose again for you. And out of an infinitely deep love for you, he came to free you from the sin in your life and shame in your life and lead you to a new life. And he came to free you for something new and better and greater. He came to free you for a greater purpose and calling on your life. That you might not just experience salvation, but you might be an instrument of redemption in the world. So here's what he's asking of you. He's asking you, just take a step towards me. Would you just step towards me this morning to walk out of enslavement and sin and into the freedom that only I can offer? And Paul says in Romans 10, 10, the only thing we have to do is believe in our hearts that he is the savior of this world and confess with our mouth that yes, you are who you say you are. And then he says, and Jesus will save you. He will free you. Will you take that step this morning? And for all of us in this room who've already said yes to that, who've already taken that step, I need you to know you've been saved for something greater. You have been saved for the betterment and redemption of this world. You've been saved to see injustices righted and captives set free and be a blessing to the world. You've been saved so the orphans have a home and the widows are cared for and the homeless are given dignity. You've been saved so others might know that there is freedom from their sin and shame. You've been saved so that you would be an ambassador for Jesus in this world, living in harmony with him and putting on display the love and grace he's shown you. You've been saved for something greater. Don't hide that under a bushel like we used to sing when I was a kid. Don't hide it under a bushel. You've been saved from something, yes, but you've been saved for something even greater. What God might do in a collection of people that recognize how amazingly loved they are by God that he would save them from enslavement to sin and that they would wholeheartedly be commissioned by God for greater things in this world, to be ambassadors of Jesus in this world, to go into our workplaces and our schools and into our friendships and into our homes and be Jesus among those who are there to invite other people to understand that there is a God who loves them deeply, who is calling them out of enslavement to sin and into a new life for something greater. Let me say it again. Jesus did not just save us from something. He saved us for something. Let's live that this week, yes? Let's live it. May that not, I don't want that, that word to stay inside the walls of this church. I want it to go with you, to dig deeply into your soul. We say at this church, we want to be a community of changed lives, changing lives, which means we want to be a bunch of people who decided we weren't just saved from something. Our lives have been changed, but we have been saved for something. We're going into the world to see other lives change as well. Are you with me on that? Yeah. This is the calling of the church. Let's pray.
God, it is with great humility that I give this message this morning. I am in absolute awe of how gracious and kind and loving you are. That you saw our plight. You saw us in this world just tattered and torn and enslaved and held hostage by sin. And you saw there is no getting out of this on their own. And that you would humble yourself and come and live among us, perfect, without sin, to be the ultimate sacrifice for our sin on the cross, to free us from our enslavement to sin, and then rise again three days later to give us the hope of a new life that starts now and goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. We are eternally grateful for that. Jesus, I know that there are some people in this room this morning that you are calling to take a step towards you. And I just, if you're in that seat right now and you hear Jesus' voice calling you to take a step out of the enslavement of sin and into new life, will you take it this morning? Will you say, Jesus, I believe that you are the Savior, that you have called me out of this enslavement of sin and into something new. And for all of us, that as we walk from this room this morning, that we would be reminded that there is no task too small, that there is no conversation too long or too short, that there's no interaction too insignificant. All of it is an opportunity for us to be agents of redemption in this world, to be people who are changed and who seek to change the world through your Spirit's work in God. Thank you for how great and glorious and amazing you are. Thank you for calling us to something greater above and beyond ourselves. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.